Oh, in a world. All right. I think we're good. So, welcome to the first episode of Middle Ground. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, a pun title, because if you're not new to this channel, then, you know, we cover many things regarding cosmology and the earth. And, you know, over here, we don't just blindly believe what we were told about the earth. And we have, you know, three real big claims that the earth is spinning and it's tilted wobbling and it's revolving around the sun as it shoots through space 500,000 miles per hour with the sun. And that entire solar system shoots through the galaxy at that half a million while the galaxy shoots 1.2 million through space. And there are actually more ve vectors than that. But so there's the idea that the earth is moving all these different crazy inconceivable speeds and vectors, but you can't feel it. And then there's the idea that the earth is a sphere. It's curving at a specific rate, a specific size. We know everywhere there is on the earth. And then there is the claim that we are in, encapsulated in a vacuum and we live in a pressurized system that's inside of a vacuum and i call this middle ground because having the conversation about whether or not the earth is actually moving all those different vectors and that would mean either the earth is at rest or it's not and if the earth is at rest it would be in the center of the universe perceivably and the alternative is oftentimes referenced as the heliocentric model, actually a misnomer that's quite archaic. It's now called a solar berry centric model just on the local system. And of course, there's this massive uh, accelerative expanding universe. We look out our telescopes and uh, the edge of the visible universe is allegedly 46 billion light years away, etc. But for intents and purposes, heliocentric, the idea of the Earth moves around the sun and the sun is at rest in relation to the earth, or the earth is at rest and the sun moves around the earth the way that we perceive it. And this is a middle ground conversation because, if you, like I said, if you're, if you're not new, you know that I do not believe that the mainstream model is true at all. Um, I suspend belief and apply empirical evidence and basic logic, and you will discover that the earth is actually a stationary topographical plane. That being said, every time I try to have a conversation with someone about geocentrism, they immediately skip over it and try to straw man this idea of a quote unquote flat earth, um, a term almost assuredly created uh, and more so popularized by someone like the CIA to characterize this conversation as stupid. And for example, if I say, do you have exclusive evidence the earth moves around the sun? Someone will say, you can't even prove eclipses on a flat earth. It's like totally irrelevant. And so let's just meet in the middle and have a discussion. That's the idea of the, of the um, new series. And of course, you got many puns in there. The ground, we're talking about what's happening on the earth. Um, so you get it. And of course, if the earth's not moving, it would put us in the middle. Of the universe so welcome to the show i encourage people to send this to people that are maybe new to the subject uh, hopefully the intro didn't trigger too much cogdis because it's famously said it's the mark of an intelligent mind to be able to entertain um, alternative ideas without believing in them and of course prior or dismissal prior to investigation is the height of ignorance so there's the intro. So if you're um, not new to this channel, I've covered geocentrism quite a bit. I have a, I have a stream called Geocentrism. It's about three and a half hours long, and I go through all kinds of mainstream astronomers and astrophysicists quotes discussing the topic of geocentrism and the viability or lack thereof. And this intro to the new series is going to be similar. It's going to be very simple, very basic, very intro level. We are going to really get into this conversation, a conversation that is entirely suppressed. It's basically labeled as dissident to even entertain it. Um, and when you really peel back the layers and you, and you understand what it is that this conversation 
actually is. The idea that it's mocked and ridiculed and labeled as dissident or insane is wildly ironic uh, and very rich. And truth is not for everyone. So if you cannot even truly investigate this conversation without um, being bogged down by preconceived notions, the necessity to conform to consensus, then you're going to have a rough time. But with all that being said, we're going to get right into it. And welcome to everyone. We're on Rockfin, Rumble, X, and YouTube. If you want to support the stream, ko-fi.com slash Witsa. If you want to donate live, it's pinned in the chat. And we're going to jump right into the presentation. So here we have, again, uh, the first episode. And it is titled The Copernican Principle. So if you're not familiar with it, we're going to break down what it is. I'm going to try not to overwhelm you because I am pretty familiar with this conversation and it goes deep. And I don't want to overwhelm someone that's new to the subject. If you stick around and you and you come and watch the show every week, we'll try to keep it where it's manageable. It's not super long. And if you actually continue to keep up with it, you will be equipped to hear some of the more advanced um, in the weeds conversations, if you will. This will blow your mind if you are new to this subject. It will absolutely blow your mind that you were not told about this, that it's suppressed, and that it's grossly misrepresented by the mainstream at the least. At the least, it has been tactically omitted and misrepresented. And for that reason alone, that should interest you and you should feel the need to inform yourself instead of allowing other people to make up your mind for you about a subject you do not even understand. Okay, so let's get into what the Copernican Principle is. Um, I've discovered that the vast majority of the public doesn't even know what that is, but once you explain it, they believe it. So let's get right into it. The Copernican Principle, in its classical form, is the principle that the Earth does not rest in a privileged or special physical position in the universe. Okay. So this is the idea the Earth doesn't occupy a special or unique position in the universe, that we're not a privileged or special observer. Basically, it's the idea that the Earth is this tiny speck of dust <clears throat> and this tucked away in this insignificant corner of this ever-expanding universe of emptiness uh, with a size and magnitude that's inconceivable to the carnal mind. Basically, you're just insignificant, and that's the idea. The reason that it's called a Copernican principle is because once you accept the idea of the Copernicus model, which is the guy, Nicholas Copernicus, presented the idea that the Earth is in fact revolving around the sun, that has implications. Certainly in modern times, it would make the Earth quite insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And so the Copernican principle was retroactively attributed to Copernicus based on the implications of his model combined with modern astronomical observations. So it's the idea the Earth doesn't occupy a special or unique position. You can probably realize the philosophical importance and implications of that idea if that were true that is drastically different than the uh, alternative which is that the earth occupies a special and unique position so this is worthy of investigation on its face if you understand the philosophy underneath it let's continue so this is a quote from copernicus and it is finally we shall place the sun himself at the center of the universe Okay, now you may notice he personifies the sun, and that's pretty weird. The reason I started it off with this quote is we're basically told that the idea that the Earth revolves around the sun, and there's a solar system with different planets, and we know exactly how it works. We know exactly how big every planet is and how far away it is and how big the universe is and how small the solar system is within that universe is presented to us as definitive science. In fact, as children, we're told that this is just definitive fact, unquestionable fact. We're not told an alternative because we know it's such a definitive fact. 
And nothing could be further from the truth. It is not science um, in its very origin, because out of one side of people's mouths, they will say, we've known this for hundreds of years. Science has proven, uh, and they had to battle the church and religion to, to prove that the earth was moving around the sun. That there's a heliocentric model. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, we've known that for so long. No, actually, at that time, what people proposed as the anomalies was that the, the sun was the center of the entire universe and the earth moved around it. Now, what's interesting is he personifies it here. I decided not to make this stream specifically about Copernicus and everything involving him. Um, I may sprinkle some more uh, very revealing quotes about him in the future in other episodes, but long story short, he uh, was an occultist. He deified the sun. He believed that it was the symbolic personification of enlightenment. It was the path to apotheosis. He consistently personified it. He said that it was singing a heavenly song and all other bodies, celestial bodies were paying homage and basically worshiping the deity that is the sun. And that is why he referred to it as a personified entity. Uh, he's very clear about this. In fact, he says at another point in time that based on the ancient conceptions where they deify the sun, I felt that I was given permission to understand my intuitive understanding that the sun is in fact a deity. And I'm slightly paraphrasing. But. So that is interesting. Just to lay out this general premise here, is it did not start as science. It started as something much different. And another major point of this quote here is that he said the sun was in the center of the universe. And if you know anything about modern cosmology or modern cosmological claims, the sun is nowhere close to the center of the universe. And that's a very primitive and archaic idea. And it's not even possibly viable based on astronomical observations. Now, he proposed this as the alternative that the earth is in the center of the universe. Now, what you will discover in this series is that the Earth being in the center of the universe actually is still to this day in 2024 viable. And not only viable, it's actually more viable and arguably the only possible explanation. So if we were to apply simple logic here at the time, he proposed the idea the sun was in the center of the universe, everything moves around it. That has been excluded as possible. Yet the actual understanding that he proposed that in opposition to is still significantly more viable than what he proposed. Think about already how misrepresented this story is in the mainstream and in consensus and via the indoctrination referred to as education. Should be very interesting. Next, Copernicus again. Near the sun is the center of the universe. Moreover, since the sun remains stationary, whatever appears as a motion of the sun is really due rather to the motion of the earth. Okay, so I added this for, for obvious reasons. Um, you guys give me feedback on the quality if something's uh, not legit. So he says here, the basic premise, and I think this is important for you to understand as you go into this, uh, let's say, examination and in, into this investigation. This is the base premise. Copernicus said he believed that the sun was some type of celestial deity. Everything moved around it. And based on that assumption, that means the sun remains stationary in the center of the universe and everything moves around the sun, basically praising it. And therefore, anytime that we see the sun moving, it's actually an illusion. The sun is stationary. It is not moving. It just appears that way because we are moving. So that's the base premise here. And as we get further on into the series and we investigate the alleged evidences of heliocentrism, they're almost all this very thing. If I say, can you provide me exclusive evidence the earth moves around the sun? Someone will say seasons. I'm saying, what do you mean by seasons? How does that prove the earth moves around the sun? Well, we see the sun. It moves in the sky throughout the year to give us seasons. Sometimes it's closer. Sometimes it's further away. So your Evidence that the earth moves around the sun is that we see the sun moving, but according to you, it's actually stationary, completely still, and not moving. If you don't see how that's fundamentally illogical 
and frankly insane to believe that it's any type of exclusive evidence. I encourage you to think about what we just talked about. All right. That's why I put that quote in there. That's just a couple from Copernicus. Obviously, he writes, um, you know, in 1543, I believe it is, uh, the revolution of celestial spheres. And it was in Latin. And we'll cover him more in depth. But I really want to drive home what the Copernican principle is, how it applies in modern times. Because now someone may kind of, although initially you're told to repeat the propaganda that we've known the earth moves around the sun for hundreds of years. How stupid. No, actually, that idea was so primitive, counterintuitive, antithetical to evidence, inadmissible logically, and stupid that it is laughably, laughably not possible at this point. So then they will move the goalpost and they will say something to the effect of, well, you know, nowadays we have more evidence and we know that the earth moves around the sun. Okay, then the very narrative you were using to mock the people not not blindly believing in it must be retired. You're not going to keep saying it, right? You're not going to keep on making this falsy, this faulty false claim that you proved it hundreds and hundreds of years ago because the model isn't even what it used to be. It's nowhere close. They said the sun was in the center of the universe, and that's not even remotely close to what is claimed now. If the earth is moving, the sun cannot be in the center of the universe. So hopefully you understand what I'm laying out here. I'm trying to keep it very simple and you're intellectually honest enough to understand there's, you're going to see this reoccurring theme that the propaganda narratives that you're told to repeat and you will hear everyone repeat and they'll do so with illusory confidence and they'll mock and they'll ridicule are actually very ignorant, easily disproven propaganda talking points. And that should make you wonder if what you're saying is true, why would you have to create, create and craft such scripts, right? All right. Here we have a bit of a bombshell for you because I know some people are familiar with this conversation. So I wanted to drop a little gem that I recently discovered in there. And we will have a lot of these in this new series. But um, if you're not familiar with kind of the sequence of events, you have Ptolemy, a geocentric model. And then you fast forward and you get Copernicus, 1543. You fast forward a little more, more you get Heiko Brahe's model, a slightly revised geocentric model. You fast forward a little bit more, you get Kepler's laws. Okay, and just to come back over here and make sure you get it, Kepler's laws is the idea, uh, or more so, it is the mapping of the planets. It's a geometric mapping of the planets. Geometry, shapes, measurements of shapes. So basically, we took... We made calculations based on the observed motions of the quote unquote planets in the sky. We map them out. They have a cycle. They move in relation to the earth and we map them out from the earth's position. And then we realize that they have a relationship. There's a somewhat consistent ratio and relationship based on how these planets move in relation to the earth where we're observing it and in relation to the sun. And so they take the periodicity and the radii of these different motions and you, you throw it in with the uh, cycles and then you get what's called Kepler's laws. And this is kinematic. So it has nothing to do with if it's truly viable in terms of like quote unquote gravity or a force that's causing it to move. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's literally just to put it very crudely. It's like a caveman going out there and writing down what he sees in the sky and then handing it off to his children. And over the course of time, they had it mapped out pretty well. They know where the planets are going to be. And then they just added an equation, applied an equation to understand where these planets would be. Here's what they won't tell you, though. This is very interesting. So this is um, William Donahue, a well-respected astronomer. Quote, we might at this point condemn Kepler of fraud and bring the case to a close, but this would be to ignore what is perhaps the most fascinating question. Why did he do it? He later goes on to say, how could Kepler, with his high regard for the truth, perpetrate such a patent fraud? And that's Kepler's fabricated figures covering up the mess and the new astronomy by, again, Dr. William Donahue, Journal for the History of Astronomy, 1988. This is what happened. You have Kepler, again, many hundreds of years ago. And many people will tell you that Kepler's laws prove heliocentricity, which is just 
grossly inept and ignorant and untrue. But what's wild, and you're going to see this happen over and over and over. And I put a few examples in this first show. You get all the way up into the 80s, and you have to have a professor of astronomy look through Kepler's raw data and his writings. He actually translated Kepler's writings from Latin. So that was a major, that's why he won awards. He was well revered for his work. What he discovered was that if it's his writings and claims are so patently fraudulent, all you have to do is compare the calculations to the chart of data, observational data in a pre in like a previous chapter. And that it's just not even close. He claims computational success based on inputs that actually aren't in the data. He had to intentionally manipulate the actual data. So what he did was make computational assumptions, so theoretical assumptions based on his, his proposed idea that wasn't working. He couldn't get it to work. He then computated it based on his assumptions and pretended that it was based on the input of observational data. This professor looked through it, and it wasn't caught until the 80s. Think about that. How many times do people say Kepler's laws, Johannes Kepler, you know, spelled with a J, pronounced with a Y, Johannes Kepler, he proved it. Kepler's laws prove it. Explain Kepler's laws. I hear it all the time. Little do they know that Kepler's laws didn't even work with the observational data. Now, a bit of a historical side note here, just so you know, he was the student of Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe actually is the one who compiled all the observational data. This is pre-telescopes, and so he had his own little uh, mechanism that he used. It was this very diligent, based on the meridian and then the actual uh, sidereal time that you made the observation. He would meticulously craft these observations over time. And it was this incredibly valuable resource at the time, and Kepler was basically underneath them. Now, there's a bit of a conspiracy as to he died after a banquet. This guy had a wild life. He got in a fight at one point, a sword fight, had his nose cut off, and so he would walk around with like gold or silver fake noses on. And, but anyway, he kept working on astronomy and his geocentric model. And then you get into the fact that he went to a banquet and then he died. And then someone apparently, they took his remains and they looked at his, they tested his mustache in like 1991 and they saw that it had tons of mercury in there. And so it's speculated that he was actually poisoned. And some speculate that it was actually Kepler based on the small amount of people who had that close proximity to him and that banquet, et cetera. And of course, he stood the most to gain because he got all of his teachers data, all the observational data. He then took it and basically stabbed him in the back, flipped all his data on his head, lied about the observational data, not matching his computational assumptions. And he is propped up as a genius that mapped out the planets to this day. And he was patently fraudulent. So if I had just told the story, people would have claimed I'm lying. So I went ahead and just quoted the guy who actually did it. I do encourage you go read this. It's way worse than this quote way worse than this quote when you go read it very interesting read again that is kepler's fabricated figures covering up the mess and the new astronomy and pretty interesting if you're unfamiliar with kepler now you get it kepler's laws mapped out the planets complete fraud now we're really going to dig into this in future episodes about wait does kepler's laws actually work wait up what's going on with mars and that may be the, the, one of the next episodes. Kepler always talks about Mars, Mars, Mars. He couldn't get Mars to work. Hey, wait till I drop the bombshell about Mars on you guys. It's pretty devastating to any assumption that the Earth is moving through space. Okay, let's continue. So this, I just want you guys to keep up with this reoccurring theme here, right? We're told that Copernicus was a scientist. He was fighting the church, and he was scared to reveal his story because the church was going to get him, and he waited till his deathbed. But in reality, he was actually good friends with the church, bringing up his heliocentric theory over a decade before he died. He wasn't scared of anything. That's a complete and total lie. And similar to the occultic underto uh, undertones of some of the, RK or the, the older Catholic church, he was a sun worshiper. So, no, he wasn't scared of anyone. That's a complete lie. He didn't wait till his deathbed to propose heliocentrism. That's also a complete lie. 
Uh, he also puts in the preface and forward of his book that it's not even necessary that his theory is probable or true. He doesn't necessarily think that it is. It just makes the math really simple and easy to work out. And so that's why he did it. He didn't even necessarily believe it to be true. People will now say, oh, he was a genius. He figured it out. That isn't what happened. But he did have a spiritual or religious and philosophical bias towards the idea the sun was in the center. He thought it was, again, the symbolic personification of enlightenment, illumination, apotheosis, the path to being godlike. Okay. So that we were completely lied to about Copernicus in the mainstream to this day. Just Google, Google Copernicus, Google what happened. Wikipedia will lie to you. All the Google searches will lie to you. Interesting. Why would they have to do that? Now we get into Kepler. Same exact thing. Completely lied about. They don't tell you that he blatantly uh, committed fraud and fabricated the figures and the computational data and lied about the observational data. Why would they have to do that? Now here is the original copy of a piece of paper that has been only recently found, okay? And this is from Isaac Newton's Principia. Here's another copy of it. This is Newton's Principia, Proposition 43, Theorem 22, original handwritten page. This was only recently discovered in the, in the 20th century, of course, written in the 17th century. And when it was published, this final page, the final proposition, was removed. I wonder why. Why are they tactically removing? Because if you write an entire proposition, one of the most famous uh, writings ever, right? The Principia, Newton's Principia. Why would you, you're going to put something as the final thing you want the reader to read. The final thing. Why would someone remove that prior to publication? And why did it take hundreds of years for people to find out it was originally there? This is why. Because what it says is in order for the earth to be at rest in the center of the system of the sun. Wait, I thought Newton proved that the earth was moving around the sun, knew it for a fact, proved it via gravity that he proved. In order for the earth to be at, the re at rest in the center of the system of the sun, planets and comets, there is required both universal gravity and another force in addition that acts on all bodies equally according to the quantity of matter in each of them and is equal and opposite to the accelerative gravity with which the earth tends to the sun. For such a force, acting on all bodies equally and along parallel lines, does not change their position among themselves and permits bodies to move among themselves through the force of universal gravity in the same way as if it were not acting on them. Since the force is equal and opposite to its gravity toward the sun, the earth can truly remain in equilibrium between these two forces and be at rest. And thus, celestial bodies can move around the earth at rest as in the Tychonic system. Again, that's Isaac Newton, Principia, Proposition 43, Theorem 22. Not to overwhelm you, if you're new to a lot of this, I'm going to explain it. Newton proposed the idea of gravity. Now, really what he did was he took Kepler's laws and he just threw mass in there. He's like, okay, well... You mapped out the planets. Um, I want to figure out kind of how it's working. Then we got to come up with some type of dynamic cause, a force. And so, okay, what does all that stuff assumably have that we could claim is causing them all to move around each other in this, this ratio, in this relationship? Matter. So I said, okay, well, we'll quantify matter. We'll come up with the concept to quantify the amount of matter. We'll call that mass. And we'll put that in your equation. We're going to add mass to your equation and claim that whatever it is that's causing these things to move around each other must be intrinsically a part of the matter, the mass. Now, he goes on to say that he doesn't even necessarily believe in this theory. He can't even understand or conceive of it, that it blows his mind, that if his theory has any semblance of truth, it must be a direct act of God, live time, causing this to be the case lifetime implementing this property because it couldn't actually be legitimized other than assumption and he goes on to say that now if we were to take this idea of my gravity and this again is the final page that was removed prior to publication if we take my idea of gravity it still doesn't mean that the earth has to go around the sun even if we assume that the sun is way bigger than the earth it still doesn't mean that because if there's an equal and opposite reaction and he brings up the fact 
that the bodies, it would act on all bodies equally in along parallel lines because, of course, you get the idea of Newton's laws of motion that an object will continue in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it. That's the classical Newton law, right? Like if you throw a baseball, it's going to continue straight unless an outside force acts upon it. And so he brings up this idea that if you take my idea of gravity, the earth could still be in the center and truly uh, establish a state of equilibrium. If there was just an equal and opposite reaction to whatever we're calling gravity, if there was a, a force akin to that, that, that opposed it, that basically was the reciprocation, the, the reaction, the equal and opposite reaction, then you could have the earth in the center at equilibrium of the entire universe with everything moving around it in perpetuity, right? Um, you wouldn't really have to, to add anything else to it. And that actually the earth could absolutely be at rest. Now, the reason this was removed in my opinion, speculation is because they pushed this guy as with the narrative that Kepler, in addition to Newton proved heliocentrism, proved the earth moves around the sun. They proved gravity. That is not true at all. That is a lie. Now, this is every single major character that I've only given you just a, a little bit of, because I don't want the show to be super long. I want it to be digestible as the first episode. I'm giving you just a, a taste of each of the major characters we're told in the mainstream version of history, the mainstream story of what allegedly verified and discovered heliocentrism to be true, and all of it is a lie. It's all being tactically lied about. Why is that? Why is that? Now, if you're intellectually honest, you're going to immediately retire all of those talking points that exclude and omit these pieces of information you weren't previously familiar with. If you're not honest, you can keep repeating it. I do not care. I'm not here to proselytize. I'm here to show truth seekers the true information. Now, here, if you're not new to this channel, you've seen this quote quite a few times, but I think it is very telling, and it kind of really drives home the point that I think is most important. Quote, People need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I could construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. Ellis has, pushed a, or has published a paper on this. Quote, you can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. In my view, there is absolutely nothing wrong in that. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria and choosing our models, and a lot of cosmology tries to hide that. That's cosmologist George Ellis in a scientific American, thinking globally, acting universally, October 1995. Very important part here is that he says, actually, the Earth could be at the center. I can make a model for you that works with the Earth at the center. And the reason that we ignore that, and it's not based on the fact we can actually disprove it based on any true observations, it's because we have a philosophical bias towards it, and we choose our model based on a philosophical criteria. And I just feel the need to tell people because people are hiding it. They're not, they're not telling you it's actually just a, a, a ideologically or philosophically biased decision that it's science, it's definitive, it's been proven. That isn't true. That isn't true. And this is very important because here's the deal, right? The Copernican principle is a philosophy. It's the idea or concept. It's the idea that the earth doesn't occupy a special position. It's the belief. It's the belief, the philosophical bias, the belief. Here, the earth doesn't occupy a special or unique position. And they will say, well, based on how big I believe the universe is, it's logical to me to assume that the earth doesn't occupy a special or unique position out of that huge universe. That would be arrogant or self-centered, earth-centric, right? I don't think we're that important. I'm not that conceited. On grounds of modesty, you know, it makes more sense to me that the earth wouldn't be special or unique. And we would just eventually get an earth when you have this huge universe and you have tons of chances and opportunities for eventually something like the earth to exist. And we only know about the earth because that's where we live. So, of course, we're going to think it's special from our limited view, but it's actually not. I'm giving you a theoretical philosophical sales pitch. I just still manned it for you. And that is not science. That is not science at all. That is a philosophy. And so you build all kinds of models based on this philosophy, the Copernican principle, that doesn't mean it's true. And you can't actually, uh, now the alternative is that the earth is special. It is unique. It holds like the most unique position in the universe, it's actually in the center of the entire universe and everything moves around it. Like we see, right? Well, you can't just prove that based on observations. You have to 
reject it based on your philosophy that you think the earth isn't special. It doesn't, it doesn't have a special position. But this is the important part. You were not told that. You weren't even told the idea of geocentrism. And if you look it up right now, it'll be like, this is how we know that geocentrism is wrong. And people will laugh at you and mock at you. Mock you. If you dare say you don't believe in the, the solar system, people will make fun of you. They don't know anything about it, but they know that everyone believes the solar system. They make fun of you. You're like four, five, six. You're taught the solar system. You're told to make a solar system model early in school. You, you're waking up in your nursery when you're like three and there's little planets above you and you're just inundated with this belief that we have proven definitively that that is true. That, that solar system model is true and that everything moves around the sun, the earth moves around the sun. That's just definitive fact. They're not even, they don't even tell you the alternatives or the history of the alternatives. And the reality is that it isn't science. It's based on philosophy. Now, here's what I want you to realize. You should be upset regardless of what conclusion you come to on your own. Hopefully you're at least uh, appalled enough to realize you need to come up to the conclusion on your own, but you should be angry that they made this decision for you. A worldview altering philosophical decision. They made it for you and just completely excluded you from it. You have no say. They didn't even tell you about it. In fact, they lied to you. They intentionally deceived you. They deceived you by tactically omitting, so they lied by omission, the alternative, the evidence that supports the alternative, and then they will, took it a step further. They gave you a narrative of how this, this other alternative wasn't true and had been disproven, and that narrative and that historical narrative was a lie. It was tactically crafted lies where they took out you know, propositions of Newton, where, where Kepler himself completely doctored his dad, and it was an entirely fraudulent postulation. They never told you that, right? And now that it's been discovered, it's, it's swept under the rug. They didn't tell you that Copernicus himself, his system didn't work. Tycho Brahe came after, and his system worked way better. Copernicus said, uh, I don't even necessarily think this is plausible, much less do I think it's true. It doesn't need to be true. I'm just proposing it because it's mathematically simpler, and I think that that moves us more in the right direction. Uh, and I find it interesting, and I do think the idea is interesting because I think the sun is super important, and he personified it, and he deified it for his own Gnostic belief. Why? And th then they told you, basically they sold you this story that science was fighting against religion. The church was holding Galileo and Copernicus back, and they were so scared. They discovered the truth scientifically and without bias, but the church wanted to kill them, so they were scared, and they, they had to fight it. And finally, science overcame religion. They wanted to believe that the earth was stationary because that's what they thought the Bible said. And That's not what happened at all. That's literally not what happened at all. Like, you want to paint this narrative that, like, Galileo was so scared of the church. Like, dude, he was put on quote unquote house arrest ostensibly in this huge castle and this huge mansion and could, had everything he ever needed. Copernicus was talking openly with members of the church about heliocentrism over a decade before he died. He didn't like have to just let it out right before he died. And then we'll cover more of this in depth in the future. And I encourage you to fact check all of this. You need to know how to research. That's why I will compile a lot of the information and I'll provide resources for all of these things. And that's why I'm citing everything specifically because it's very difficult to find now. I encourage if you're going to use a uh, search engine, use Yandex. Can't trust Google with any of this conversation at all. So that's Y A N D E X.com. But everything about uh, Galileo, for example, he actually wrote a letter that's, that completely disavowed uh, heliocentrism prior to him dying. He didn't actually believe in it. So he actually believed it was heresy. And what did they do? They hid that letter. And then a professor, once again, starts digging, finds this letter, finds out there was fraud in terms of someone trying to erase his signature because they were so angry about it. And then now they've created a whole narrative where there's this other letter, allegedly, and there was actually another letter that was d disavowing helio or geocentrism. And they came with this whole narrative after the fact to hide it after they lied about it for centuries. So they, they're lying about Copernicus. What he said, what his letters say, they're lying about Galileo, what he said, what his letters say, they're lying about their observations, they're lying about the accuracy of their predictions, they're lying about the accuracy of their models and their theories, they're, they're taking the work out of Newton, they're lying about what Newton said, who said he thought gravity was insane, and to believe that gravity would act on innate brute matter through the vastness of a vacuum over long distances without some intermediate medium is to him so great an absurdity that no man with competent faculty of thinking could, in philosophical matters, could ever fall into it. He 
thought that the modern version of gravity was so stupid that if you were even slightly competent, you would never believe it. What are we told? He proved it because he saw an apple fall and he thought, oh, that means the moon is falling on me right now. And it's just so stupid. And the amount of lies that are pushed into this mainstream narrative off the rip before we even start getting into all the observations, all the physics, all the kinematics, all the dynamics, all the astronomical evidence, which by the way, that's where you actually get to the direct refutation of the mainstream model. Prior to that, you should be insulted. You should feel like your, your intelligence is insulted that they've led you into this worldview your entire life with overt lies as if you weren't able to try to look at the evidence for yourself and figure it out. And again, it has major implications. One can believe the earth is just insignificant. It's a random piece of dust in this ever expanding universe of happenstance. And just because it's so big randomly happened, there's really no importance. It doesn't mean that anything special about the earth. It just, the universe is so big that of course there's a randomly a piece of dust that eventually something lived on. The universe is so old and so big, that, like, you know, the odds stack up that eventually it'll happen. That's way different than, oh, it's incredibly special and unique. Nothing else has a more special position. It's in the center of everything. Everything is moving around it. Now your next logical question is, whoa, how to get there? Why is it important? If it's so important, like, why is it? And how did it get, get in the middle, right? Like, who placed it there? Those are drastically different worldviews. Even if you believe that you're a, a creationist now, and it's like you still have a tainted worldview that was crafted to you, for you, by people. I made a philosophical decision and lied to you about all of the details so that they could do that. All right, rant over, but that's, it's wild to me. It's absolutely wild. And to support what he said, as he said here, if you pay attention uh, closely, he said, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with earth at its center and you cannot disprove it based on observations. We'll go further here in 2007. Also, it appears that the galaxies of the universe are arranged in concentric spheres around the Earth. John Hartnett and Kochi Hirano did a study that indicates that the red-shifted galaxies are periodically spaced. The data is statistically significant to the four sigma level, meaning there is a 99.994% probability that galaxies are preferentially distributed in distinct shells. And that is the galaxy redshift abundance periodicity from Fourier analysis of number counts using SDSS and 2DF GRS galaxy surveys 2007. I accidentally cited it twice. Sigma 4, that's 99.994% probability that the galaxies are preferentially distributed in geocentric circles outside of the Earth. That makes no sense. Why would the distant galaxies be preferentially distributed relative to Earth? This is a major problem. So he said, oh, I can make a model for you. It works perfectly. You can't disprove it on observations. In fact, you can't, you can't prove the alternative based on the observations. You have a major problem. There can't be preferential. It's supposed to be like completely without any relation to the Earth whatsoever. The Earth is random. It has nothing to do. Who cares? Why would the distant galaxies care about the Earth? This isn't just about redshift and how it looks. This is the amount of redshift and the actual periodical distribution, separation of the galaxies. It's very simply how they are spaced out in a very specific preferential pattern in relation to the Earth. They shouldn't be doing that. Why would they be doing that? And concentric circles. How do you get concentric circles, galaxies lining up in concentric circles relative to the Earth randomly? Okay, and just go look it up. This is a galaxy survey, very, very respected source. All right, here we go, a classic quote here. And this is, of course, the theory of relativity's inventor, allegedly, although it was all plagiarism, Albert Einstein. That's the current theory that is believed. Quote, the struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus, of course, Ptolemy was a geocentrist and proposed a geocentric model in, I guess, around uh, 200 B.C., and Copernicus, which again, that's heliocentrism 1543, would then be quite meaningless. So the, the dispute between the two would be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, quote, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or quote, the sun moves and the earth is at rest, 
would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. That's Albert Einstein, Einstein and Infield, The Evolution of Physics, 1938, page 248. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? I mean, he just tells you that the idea that the Earth is stationary and the sun moves around it or vice versa, they're equally valid statements in terms of coordinate systems, observations, how things move. They're just equally valid. And this whole argument back in the day, he said it doesn't really matter. It makes no sense in, in reality because like, it could be either one. Now, actually, when you further examine the evidence, it can't be either one. Only the Earth at rest can possibly explain all the observations, and we're going to get further into that in future episodes. but. It is just still interesting how he proposed the special relativity theory in 1905, general theory of relativity in 1915. This was in response to something else we'll cover later, which is you got Mickel Mickelson Morley 1887 that comes after Aries failure and many other tests. Um, it kind of explained like, oh, why does it look like the Earth is stationary even with highly precise measurements of interferometry, which shouldn't be the case? And he ends up coming to the conclusion that this is years after the fact, and he's just basically saying, so it turns out, yeah. The, the earth could definitely be in the center and the sun could be moving around it. You don't say. Okay. A few more quotes here. We have astronomer Fred Hoyle quote. We know the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only. And that such a difference has no physical significance. This is an astronomy and cosmology, a modern course, uh, the citations right there. Astronomer Fred Hoyle is the person who coined the term Big Bang. Got another quote from him here. The relation of the two pictures, that's geocentricity and heliocentricity, is reduced to a mere coordinate transformation, and it is the main tenet of the Einstein theory that any two ways of looking at the world which are related to each other by a coordinate transformation are entirely equivalent from a physical point of view. Today, we cannot say that the Copernican theory is right and that the Ptolemaic theory is wrong in any meaningful physical sense. All right. Now we have well-renowned theoretical physicist and cosmologist, atheist Lawrence Krauss. Quote, but when you look at the CMB map, for those who don't know, that's the cosmic microwave background map. You also see that the structure that is observed is, in fact, in a weird way, correlated with the plane of the Earth around the sun. Of course, he assumes that the Earth goes around the sun. could be vice versa, and the Earth, the sun obviously has its orbit in relation to the sun, or to the Earth. Is this Copernicus coming back to haunt us? That's crazy. We're looking at the whole universe. There's no way there should be a correlation of structure with our motion of the Earth around the Sun. The plane of the Earth around the Sun, the elliptic, that would say we are truly the center of the universe. And it's so crazy, even with this concession here, um, he's holding on to the idea that Earth moves around the Sun and just that the whole universe is in relation to the, our solar system being in the center. But in re reality... Everything we observe, including the, the motion of the sun itself, it all moves around the earth. So that's Lawrence Krauss. Here's another new, newer quote. Quote, thus many see the significance of the Copernican theory as summed up in what is called the, quote, Copernican principle, which is today's stream, or sometimes, quote, the principle of mediocrity. So there you go. Again, not important. Mediocre not special or unique. The claim that there is nothing special about our Earth, and by extension, nothing special about its inhabitants. We, however, suggest the surprising conclusion that a number of important scientific results indicate that our great-grandchildren may live in a world where the Copernican principle has been consigned to the dustbin. In their world, Earth will be understood to be special indeed, possibly even unique, swimming in a vast alien universe that speaks, speaks to them about Earth's specialness. Life as we know it, published in the Notre Dame magazine. That's Michael Crow, who is a, again, well-respected, often awarded professor from Notre Dame. I believe this is my last quote. And here is a famous... Theoretical physicist that everyone's surely heard of, Richard Feynman. You have Feynman lectures. You have his um, 
or his uh, contribution to quantum physics is what he's most well known for. Quote, I suspect that the assumption of uniformity of the universe reflects a prejudice. <clears throat> hmm. It would be embarrassing to find, after stating that we live in an ordinary planet, about an ordinary star, in an ordinary galaxy, that our place in the universe is extraordinary. To avoid embarrassment, we cling to the hypothesis of uniformity. Now, uniformity being, of course, the idea that the entire universe is it's all spreading out uniform, homogenous, evenly distributed in this uniform, even distribution. All the energy is all spreading out evenly, all energy and matter. It's homogenous, and that's required to claim that the Earth is not special or unique in its position. And so they assume homogeneity. And he's pointing out that this idea, this I suspect that the assumption of uniformity of the universe reflects a prejudice. You don't say. Of course it does. Of course it does. And he's saying they basically cling on to the hypothesis of uniformity to avoid embarrassment. Think about how embarrassing it would be for us to constantly harp on the fact as the foundational staple of all of our cosmology, all of our astronomy, all of our astrophysics, our astrophysics and theoretical physics, that we're just this insignificant, ordinary planet going around an ordinary star and an everyday ordinary galaxy to find out that actually our place is super special and extraordinary, be this huge pill of humility. We will just exclude and avoid that to avoid embarrassment as long as possible if it were true. Richard Feynman. Got to give him props for at least pointing this out. And here we have astrophysicist Celery Air. And do we really see a cosmological constant in the supernova data, astronomy and astrophysics? Quote, ruling out the cosmological principle, which is what the Copernican principle is also referred to as, because it's, again, it's the base tenet of modern cosmology that the Earth is not special or unique. And no matter what the data says, we have to interpret it through the assumption that the, where the, wherever the Earth is, it's not actually special or unique. It's just totally random and unimportant. Ruling out the cosmological principle is a valid interpretation of the data. She is not saying that geocentrism is viable or possible. She's saying that a valid interpretation of the data is that it directly rules out the Copernican principle as even possible. A few more quotes here. Because if someone's going to believe in the mainstream, they need to understand the mainstream official narrative story. If they're going to appeal to the authorities, they need to know what the most well-revered and respected authorities have to say. You need to understand what it is that you are believing prior to belief. You definitely can never have a justified belief if you don't even understand it. Here is the infamous Stephen Hawking in The Theory of Everything from 2002. Quote, it might seem that if we observe all other galaxies to be moving away from us, then we must be at the center of the universe. There is, however, an alternative explanation. The universe might look the same in every direction as seen from any other galaxy, too. This, as we have seen, was Friedman's second assumption. We have no scientific evidence for or against this assumption. We believe it only on grounds of modesty. It would be most remarkable if the universe looked the same in every direction around us, but not around other points in the universe. Remarkable to the materialists' assumption that the Earth is not special. That is specifically what he's saying. So there, there is, again, Stephen Hawking explaining exactly what I said, just to kind of, so you don't wa start to watch this series and somehow convince yourself this is just this crazy um, science denier misrepresenting things. No, this is, this is, everything I'm saying is easily verifiable and accurate. Here he is again. So which is real, the Ptolemaic or Copernican system? Again, that's heliocentricity or geocentricity, geocentrism, heliocentrism. Although it is not uncommon for people to say that Copernicus proved Ptolemy wrong, that is not true. One can use either picture as a model of the universe, for our observations of the heavens can be explained by assuming either the Earth or the Sun to be at rest. This is in the 2000s Stephen Hawking. I'm telling you, all of our heavenly, quote-unquote heavenly observations can perfectly be explained with the Earth at rest. 
I think this is the last quote we got for you. This is Professor of Physics Richard Kahn Henry, Review of Quantum Enigma in 2006. Quote, it is more than 80 years since the discovery of quantum mechanics gave us the most fundamental insight ever into our nature, the overturning of the Copernican Revolution and the restoration of human beings to centrality in the universe. He goes on to say, and yet, have you ever before read a sentence having meaning similar to that of my preceding sentence? Likely you have not. And the reason you have not is, in my opinion, that physicists are in a state of denial and have fears and agonies that are very similar to the fears and agonies that Copernicus and Galileo went through with their perturbations of society. Interesting. Interesting. All right, there is all the quotes I put together for this episode. So... There's the there's the PowerPoint middle ground episode one the Copernican principle. I didn't want to overwhelm people too much here, but I can take some questions and check some super chats. I want to keep the stream actually kind of short so that someone can you can send it out and people can watch it. But I'll give you the base the base premise here. Um, all astronomical observations show that the Earth is in the center, and the current model says, oh well, that's an illusion. And if you stick around, and, and the reason that I, I went about it this way is I know that one of the main spells and one of the main intimidation fact tactics used is like, oh, you think you're smarter than all the scientists. I can't believe you're stupid enough to listen to this person or that person or to believe this because all, you think all the scientists are wrong. You think all the consensus of all the authorities is wrong. It's like, no, you are misrepresenting the authorities that you're appealing to. Now, I obviously don't just blindly believe things that quote unquote authorities say. That's ridiculous. What happens when two authorities disagree? You can't just take the word of a quote-unquote authority as the gospel. It's just fundamentally fallacious and illogical. But the point is that they don't even know what the actual case is. The actual case is there's a group of people that are like, man, we're really holding on to this idea philosophically, and it's just because we have a philosophical bias. It's a prejudice, to quote Feynman. And we only believe it on grounds of modesty, to quote Hawking. And we do it to avoid the intolerable nature of a preferred and special location, to quote Edwin Hubble. But really, it isn't necessarily true. And that there is no observation that you can make that would actually prove it, to quote Hawking and Fred Hoyle. And it's kinematically identical, just a flip of the coordinate system and that the actual whole debate and struggle back in the day was pretty meaningless because you could say the earth is at rest and the sun moves around it or vice versa. And they're equally valid to quote Einstein. And the heliocentricity and geocentricity are identical in value and viability. And you just based on the actual methodology used to map out the planets in relation to the observations, Fred Hoyle. And it goes on and on and on. This is just a glimpse. Now, obviously, uh, if you go to geocentrism on my channel, you can't really Google it or look it up on YouTube. You'll have to actually go manually to my live, go down quite a bit. You'll see geocentrism. You can Yandex it. It'll be like the fifth or sixth result down. If you want to sit there and listen to me just read quotes the whole time, then you can do that. Now, I won't be doing that every single time. What I'll be doing is putting together different PowerPoints with visuals and explanations and really breaking down exactly how this all works. So in the coming, the coming episode, we'll talk about what exactly is kinematics and dynamics. How, if we see the planets move, how does that work for, so that you can actually have a concept and understanding of exactly what the alternative is of geocentrism. And I'm going to start sprinkling in some gems for the people that have been here and are kind of familiar with this. Trust me, I've already found quite a few things. And actually, you can disprove the heliocentric model by looking up in the sky. Um, and I will reveal some of that. In the next episode, episode after that, I have, I'm going to blow people's minds as to the fraudulent nature of what Kepler did. Um, and I'm going to blow people's minds in terms of the actual mechanisms of motion that are possible and what are not possible. Not only is geocentrism possible, it's predicting anomalies that the heliocentric model doesn't predict and can't explain. Uh, and that's all I'll say right now. It's, it's, it's wild. And there's a modern or there's a there's a observation coming up in December in the end of December that would definitively prove one way or the other and we all know which way it's going to go it's going to go the way of geocentrism and that's an observation of Mars so we will get into more of um 
in depth about the specific evidence, the tests that were done throughout the years that showed the earth was uh, not moving, the observations that showed the earth was not moving, all the shucking and jiving and the reifying and the moving of the goalposts and changing the theories that were done for the heliocentric belief system. And uh, hopefully you can become informed enough that you can feel comfortable in your decision. And yeah, I mean, you know, uh, oh no, you may find out that this place is special and designed or something. And yeah, well, if it is, wouldn't you want to know? Like, I did. Why would you be mad at me? You know, why? Why would you attack me? Like, wouldn't you be grateful that this place was made? And that's how you should look at it. So cool. There's that. That's just an intro. Let me double check. Um, any donations? If not, I'm gonna wrap it up. I've had a long day. Like I said, I'm gonna try to keep these kind of short. This is just a this is a very elementary intro one, so I know it's maybe not all the fireworks some people are wanting. I just want people to be introduced to the idea and for it to be digestible and shareable. Uh, we'll have Skull and Glovers coming back Wednesday. This will be on every Monday night, 9 30. I have a few different uploads coming up. I have a couple other streams unrelated to cosmology in general coming up this week as well. So stay tuned. And if you just uh, check my Kofi, Kofi.com slash Witsit. And especially if you're a member, you'll get notifications and you'll get exclusive access. And then check my YouTube and I should have the streams up a bit in advance where you'll be able to see what's coming up. How dare you. Keep your head on a swivel down there. I don't trust it. Yeah, it's all good. The creator's in control. Whatever's supposed to happen, happen. Thank you for the $20 tip, Ryan, on Kofi. Uh, Run Boston, thanks for streaming, bro. Quality info. If anyone else wants to bless, what's it? Use the pinned comment. Shout out to Run Boston. Very generous. $77, brother. And what he said. Yeah, help our brother out. But thank you so much, man. Always generous uh, helping out the channel. Amy, I see a few people here that are getting their monthly subs in. Make sure I don't miss any donations. I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, if you want to be a miswit, sign up. You'll get access to exclusive Kofi stuff. And then I actually on my Kofi, I put a way that you can actually make it like a little app. So you don't have to always go to the website. You just click the app. You can also turn on notifications. And that's the way you'll get the exclusive um, streams. Hopefully, you guys turn on notifications because sometimes I don't keep like random spontaneous streams on there. It's kind of like a catch it, like turn your notifications on and catch it type of thing. But all right, cool. I'm actually going to wrap this up very quickly. This will be one of the shortest streams I've done in so long. Apparently, I don't think Rock, I don't think Rumble ever started working. I don't really know. Um, over on Rockfin, $5. I heard every time you donate to Austin, FTFE spirals and McToon sheds a tear. Thank you so much, Fish at Montana. $5. Thanks for keeping at it, Austin. Yeah, of course. Hubble's horror. Thank you so much. Right, we're just going to start it. This series will be super great. Uh, quality information, and there will really be no coming back from it if you can actually get someone you care about to sit down and digest it and listen and be honest and open-minded, especially with the, with the future streams where we're going to really break down the concepts with visual aid. Um, so I encourage people to stay tuned. All right, we're caught up on everything. And so I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'll play the same intro that we played to get out of this. I know this is shorter than people uh, are used to, but it is what it is. Great stuff. What's it? Thank you so much. Awesome show tonight. Great presentation. Thank you guys. All right. I love you guys. Seek and speak truth unequivocally. The weak find contentment in the consensus of ignorance. So who cares what other people think? They're always going to attack you, typically from an ignorant position. That's happened throughout all of history. In fact, some of the smartest, brightest people were attacked by people that were incredibly ignorant or not as intelligent as them. And just in general, you know how that is. The weak find contentment in the consensus of ignorance. So it doesn't really matter what people think, man. Like, doesn't the truth matter? Certainly when the truth has as big as big of implications as something like this discussion does, you should be honest, be strong, look into the truth. Once you find the truth, you have to speak the truth. And um, that's a very liberating and freeing way to live. Um, and that's what the creator wants. You know, that's what the creator wants from you. And if you're not there, we're understanding anything in terms of the creator, just you, you should care about the truth for you. And even if it's just from a prideful standpoint, it's like, you're really going to let these people decide for you, what you believe and make philosophical decisions for you. And then make sure that they don't let you see the information as if you are a child that can't be, uh, 
that isn't responsible enough and can't be trusted to see the actual evidence and information for yourself and what the truth is and make up your own mind. So they have to tactically hide things from you so that they can make sure you believe what they think you need to believe. I mean, you should be offended. So, okay. And always speak the truth because what's true is rarely popular and what's popular is rarely true until Wednesday. Schooling Globers coming back. That's season two. I'll catch up with you guys on the flip. Peace.